Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online. This is our Saturday service, and we will be reading from Psalms 37, verse 37. And I have muted everyone so that the recording comes out cleaner. Anyway, so now... I am about to read. Okay. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Now, what came to my mind this morning was raising the bar. Yeah, raising the bar. And my question to you is, are you raising your bar or are you lowering it? Or do some of you have no bar at all? Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, all right, let me put it in human terms. Let's go back in my past. When I was a teenager, I was what you would call the slouchy one. I was the one whose hair was always in disarray, whose clothes were never pressed that neatly. I was frumpy and slouchy. I wasn't much to look at. And here's the thing, I didn't know it. But when I came to California, I noticed I couldn't figure out what made the difference. But in New York, that was commonplace. You see a woman walk down the streets with rollers and slippers and a robe going to the store. Wouldn't think anything of it. Here in California, I noticed the women were well-groomed, the young ladies in high school, well-groomed. And I wasn't used to seeing the majority look like that. So that was quite interesting. Then as I got older and I went to uh, junior college, I noticed the same. But I still couldn't figure out what the difference was until I got in my 30s. I was trying to improve on my appearance, but I couldn't tell what the difference was. And sometimes, if you don't have an eye, if you have not been made aware of something, you don't realize where you really are in comparison to where you really could be. Now, here I was in my mid-30s, having been called by God into a career of a hairstylist. And I went to cosmetology school, and one of the teachers really got my attention. Her name was Bessie Radcliffe, and this woman was a phenomenal teacher. She not only taught the skill, she also taught the attitude, the character, and your carriage, your professional carriage. And she started to make it obvious to me what was the difference in me. I watched how she dressed. I watched how she carried herself. And I said, that's what I'm missing. I'm not polished. I don't have my colors coordinated. My clothes aren't neat like that. I mean, it really opened my eyes. And she became the bar for me. So I had to raise my bar in order to bring improvement to my appearance. Does that make it plain for you? All right. So here I am deciding I no longer want to look like a frumpy little slouch for the rest of my life. I want that clean cut together look, even when I'm looking casual, like today with a rag on my head. All right. But I bought it for my head. It is a head scar. And there was a time my hair would be looking like, mm, yeah. So as my friend would say, God know <laughs> who to thunk it, what for, and please don't do it no more. But anyway, so I'm looking at this woman, the way she wears her walking shoes and how it's coordinated with her outfit and how her jewelry and her hair and everything is always in place. 
And I noticed how she carried herself and how she addressed the class. And I looked at her and I said, wow, I want to be like her when I grow up. Honestly, she has no idea how she impacted my life to this day. But she impacted me greatly. And then as I learned about color coordinating, and color consulting and cool colors and warm colors and what colors look best for your complexion and this, that, and the other, and what looked worse. And what, and then I started looking at clothing. I started looking at larger women because I've always been large and I'm watching now what makes that woman look heavy and what makes that woman look. Phew. Yeah. And I said, that's what it is. You have to elongate. You have to contour. You have to square off the rounded shoulders. You, you have to wear the V instead of the round neck if you want your neck to look like it's longer. I'm coming up with all these ideas as I'm watching people. Now, what I'm saying all that to say to you, I have to make one more point. This is for you men. Some of you men, I got this from my husband. He was very very conscientious of how your clothing affected your look. And he told me about one of the guys in church. And he said, you notice that every time they're in church, the first thing you notice is that they have a belly. And I said, yeah. He said, you know why that is? I said, no. He said, because when you have any kind of a pooch, you never wear your tie above your belt line. You wear your tie where it meets the middle of your belt, and it helps to bring attention away from the big belly. I never thought of that. Another thing for big men, double-breasted suits with very squared off shoulders look very slenderizing for a big man who's big in the middle. Now, okay, that's your, your little education for the day. But those, that's for those of you who are raising the bar on your appearance, who are raising the bar. You, those of you who want to improve, like I was complimenting Rashad earlier about how he's working on his voice, his diction, his uh, using his vocabulary more correctly, pronouncing words correctly. That is a good thing when you're always in the mode of improvement. My question to you is when it comes to the things of God, to your walk with the Lord, are you working on improving or are you satisfied with the status quo? That's what I want to ask you. Some of you, and I hear it all the time, there are born-again Christians out there that think it's commonplace and normal to cuss. They think it's normal to use the F word and the SH word and the, and the G-O-D, using God's name in vain with the D-A-M-N and all. I mean, they just, they throw it all out there. And they have all these reasons why they're not cuss words. But I say this to you. If anything has a negative feeling to it, to the point where you feel that feeling when they say something angrily at you and they're shouting and bawling you out and they throw a few choice words in there, those words don't make you feel good. This is what I say. Do you want the devil's words, his language, his mode of conversation flying through your mouth when your words are to be used for God's glory? Okay, moving right along. Uh, some of you, you dress certain ways. You dress to catch. You're not dressing to, I mean, you're dressing to impress, but you're not dressing to uh to go to move forward to move up in life you're dressing to lay down in life because you're trying to get a good leg let's, let's put the rubber where the road is so you see this fine hunk of woman you see this shapely chick and you dress in a way that you know is gonna catch and you carry yourself in that way 
or some of you see this fine hunk of man and you say, okay, that looks like a good one in the bed for me. I'm, I'm ready. I, I've, I've been without for a while. I need my needs met. God just has to understand. Well, let me straighten you out on that. God does not have to understand a thing. Not when it comes to sin. So, who are you hanging out with? See, this has a lot to do with it. What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you investing into your spirit? Because whatever you're investing, have you ever heard the expression, association brings assimilation? The reason they knew that Peter in the New Testament, when Jesus was, was, was being taken, you know, for questioning and, and uh, torture and all that stuff, getting ready to be crucified. The reason Peter was found out by these people, their one statement to him was, we know you're one of those disciples. We know you're a follower of Jesus because your speech betrays you. King James says, your speech betrayeth you. The reason his speech betrayed him was because he was around Jesus. He picked up his mode of conversation, his mode of communication, his words, his phraseology. He picked up all of these mannerisms. Being around Jesus for three solid years, he picked up a lot the holiness of God, all the things of God. He picked all that up, but now he's afraid. So he gets around a bunch of unbelievers that he's cussing like a sailor. So he blends in with the crowd because he doesn't want to stand out as a follower of Jesus because he's scared. They'll hurt him too. But the woman still said, no, your speech betrays you. My question to you is, does your speech betray you? Can anybody tell you're a Christian by your public conversation at the bank? Can anybody tell you're a Christian by how you talk to the guy at the convenience store after you get your gas? Can people tell that you're a Christian? What comes out of your mouth? Cuss words or blessings? Arguing, fussing, fuming, complaining, attitude or sweetness? grace, kindness. What comes out of you? What do people see? And if you have an attitude problem, are you raising the bar so you can improve on that attitude? Or are you lowering the bar so you can make all kinds of excuses to keep your little attitude? Are you rationalizing how you tell people off and put a, I know a woman told me one time she was at the hospital. And I'm telling you, she was so proud of herself. And she called herself a Christian. She was so proud of herself. And she was telling me with the tee hee hee and her voice and a little wink to what she did. I wasn't winking. It wasn't funny to me. Because I knew that she left a lot of people's feelings being hurt. People in the hospital are trying to do their job the best they can. Some of them are just following orders. And this woman made their life a living hell. She complained. She told me some of the stuff she told them about how, you know, you should die. You try to kill me. I hope you die. I hope you wither. I hope, I mean, all this just, whoo. She wasn't only cussing at them. She was cursing them, cursing their future, cursing their, their whole being and, and their families. I mean, it was just. It was horrendous, the things she was saying. And I said, do you think that they thought you were Christian when you did that? Or do you think that they thought you loved them? Or, or were you just enjoying hurting their feelings? Well, I just didn't like the way they treated her. She skipped right on by that. And she came up with all the reasons that justified her little nasty attitude. Hmm. Do you do that? Do you do it? And the other thing that got me was she was so proud of herself. She said, I think they heard me all the way down the hallway. 
And I said to myself, what a shame. What a shame that you take pleasure in what you're saying right now. What a shame that you're basking in that moment that you were in hurting people's feelings and humiliating them in public. What a shame. You know, my question to you, my question to you is where has your bar been set? Who are you measuring yourself by? The perfect man, the upright, the ones trying to live holy, the ones trying to clean up their language, clean up their attitude, clean up their behavior, or those that excuse every little moment. They live in the flesh. They act in the flesh. They go after the flesh. Everything is flesh, flesh, flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not, check this out, after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of light in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, this is what I want you to, to, to see. I got to get the screen on because I want to make sure I'm doing this where you can see me. All right. Now, I'm going to stand up. So I got to raise the camera. All right. I'm going to stand up. Now, some of you, when you're going after something, you're pursuing it. You're going after, you ever see a pit bull go after something? Ah, and they're, they're salivating. They have to have it. They, they just got to go out. They're going after it with all their might. Some of you go after your flesh like that. I mean, think about the flesh. Yeah, 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 I got to have it. Oh, yeah. Come on, bring it on, bring it on. I can't get enough of this funky stuff. Bring it, baby, bring it on. And then some of you are going after holiness and you're going after the Lord and you're like, God, I hunger and thirst after you. Yes, as a deer panted, so I pant after you. I'm hungering, I'm thirsting. Lord, teach me your ways and I'll walk in the Lord. Teach me your truth. Show me if there be any wicked way in me. Oh, God, help me. Correct me. Don't let me falter. Watch me, Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. You're going after the things of the Spirit. Now, my question to you is, what are you going after? What are you going after? Hmm. Think about it. What is your life pursuit? Is it him? Is it her? Is it them? Is it that? Huh? Is it that source of entertainment? Hmm. Is it what you watch on the internet? At the movies? At the dance hall? Where they're letting all the little boobies show and all the little shape and all their little privates out in the open. What are you watching? You're buying magazines, flipping with one hand while you're working with the other. What are you doing with your flesh? What are you doing? You're going after the things of God. You're grabbing the Bible. You're reading. You're searching. You're asking God to give you understanding. You're seeing your weaknesses. Oh, God, help me line up. Are you working on it? Or are you sitting on it? Raise the bar. You know, when you do archery, all right, let me do another illustration here. When you do archery, and you hold that, the, um, the, the bow, you pull that arrow back. You pull it back. Now, the further you pull it, when you let go, the further it's going to go. But, if you want to get more distance, you raise that baby up and aim high. When you aim high and you pull back as far as you can and you let go, that arrow shoots higher. But if you aim low, 
and you let go, that arrow is going to hit the ground before it goes far. How high is your aim? What are you aiming at? Are you aiming, are you looking to the hills from whence cometh your help? Or are you satisfied with the, like the turkeys are, waddling on the ground? You'll never fly with the eagles, hanging with turkeys. Who is your example? Who are you setting your bar by? Jesus, the disciples, the followers of Christ that are in your immediate life? your immediate vicinity, or your homies from the streets that you used to hang with? Huh? Who, is you, who are you setting your bar by? Who is your example? Who is your goal? Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Hmm. Who do you like talking like, acting like, walking like, dressing? We all imitate to a point. Because monkey see monkey do. That's the, that's the way it is with the, with the nature of the human beast. That's just the way it is. But some of you have a mind of your own. And you don't follow the status quo. You don't follow the crowd. You go the narrow road. Because you're seeking a higher plane. You're not seeking commonplace. You're seeking a higher plane. So you're living, you're going after the things of the spirit. You're going after it, hot pursuit. And I ask you now, and I'm going to end this message on this. Which would you rather have? The low levels of the street life, the low levels of the world's basic uh, values, the low levels of the things that appeal to the flesh, that entice the flesh, that warm the flesh by the devil's fire? Or are you reaching higher, higher heights? Are you reaching further? Are you pushing yourself to go beyond you by the power of God's might through the power of his Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus? Pursuing the heart of God, the mind of Christ, the spirit of the living God. What are you doing with your life? Where have you set your bar? 